Hello, and welcome back to the veg garden. So we are now on to Wednesday, and today we'll be talking about soil health. So what have we got there? Five, yeah, there's another five points here in this video that I'll be covering as far as soil health are concerned. So the first is soil organic matter. The second is perennials. The third is cover crops and erosion. The fourth is amendments. And the fifth is diversity in your plantings. So to start off with, I'll be talking about soil organic matter. And soil organic matter is essentially a posh word for compost. So compost is the best way in which we can import um, soil organic matter into our gardens and get it in. Um, soil organic matter locks in moisture helps retain moisture, helps prevent the sun's UV from bleaching and sterilizing the soil, which is a bad thing because we want it to keep nice and covered, which means it's more, it can be more biologically diverse, which then in turn prov provides higher yields of more nutritious produce. So this can be implemented from pasture to hay meadow to right the way down to a container in your back garden or all the way up to you know big fields um, of you know multiple different types of grains or whatever what have you soil organic matter is the building blocks of the soil without that you don't get very good plants so by increasing the soil organic matter concentration you can increase directly increase your yields and their nutrient density so in all of the top garden beds I put over winter a six inch layer of either cow horse goat manure and what else did I use cow horse goat and I used a bit of chicken but that was just here and there just mixed in to see as an experiment and I did one that was just all the materials that I had off the top garden chopped and dropped in one pile covered over and left to rot down break down into compost and it's a really good way of ensuring that you've locked in as much moisture as possible with cover top dressing um, or you know bed prep whatever you want to call it um, but by putting that in a good thick layer of organic matter, you're locking in a lot of moisture. I don't have to water my bed for two weeks after we've had the last rain. And that's because there's so much soil organic matter already. And that's the second year of it being there. These beds, this is the second growing season. So we've only had them a year now. And we've locked in a load of moisture. And I mean a load. You know, you, you couldn't ask for better. Um, you know, there is always a ways and methods of improving, yes, but on the whole, we're in a pretty good place. The next thing I'm gonna to talk to you about, as far as soil health is concerned, is perennials. Now, as you can see it here, this is a perennial. This is a black currant. And this was a cutting that I took in the autumn, this last year. This is gonna sequester carbon out of the air for many, 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 many years. So you could also have trees, um, you know, fruit trees. If we plant a fruit tree, you get a yield off it and you'll sequester carbon, it's a win-win. But not only that, soil health is to have healthy soil, you need roots in the soil that can bring in the carbon out of the air and feed it to the microbes in the soil through glucose, basically, and other sugars, carbohydrates, and stuff like that. So they feed sugars, basic sugars, to soil organisms, which then 
give the plant nutrients in return. So it's a symbiotic relationship. So by having perennials in the soil, you're keeping those little organisms in the soil happy over winter because a lot of your summer veg will be out. Which moves on to the next point of erosion and cover cropping. Cover crops can be anything. You know, it doesn't just have to be that you cut it, cut it down and, and mulch with it. In my tunnel now, I have removed all the lower leaves of the tomatoes. I can see all the compost. I could plant into that now radishes, chard, beetroot, cabbages, radish, turnips, you name it. And I could grow them on and pick them and eat them but it will keep roots in the soil. When those tomatoes are gone, then I've already got plants in there. When I'm removing the tomatoes, I'm not removing the tomatoes, then planting, I've planted already. So that can be done from now, well, from the day you put your tomatoes in on. You could sow carrots under your tomatoes in June, say, and then when your tomatoes finish, you could have an understory of just carrots. And then, through the winter you could be picking carrots out of the tunnel and as long as everything is well most things are out by the time you want to put your tomatoes back in or you know if you know that's where the tomato goes that's where the tomato lives that little area that's where you plant the tomato as long as that area is cleared you can put another thing in you could under you could plant that whole thing with a perennial ground cover strawberry no you wouldn't do strawberries and tomatoes but you could go chamomile lawn chamomile um even clover red and white and crimson clover you could understory with clover dig scratch away the clover in little holes and plant you'd have to plant bigger tomatoes but the clover would be putting nitrogen into the tomato bed then you wouldn't have to fertilize with the chemical fertilizer because that would be fixing nitrogen into the soil in a biological way which means that nitrogen is locked in the soil in an organism that's not going to leach through if you over water it's not going to run out and you lose it you're not going to lose a biological nitrogen it's, it's stuck there until it gets you step back into the leaves there are ways of losing it, but they're not as simple as overwatering or even basic watering, you know. But, you know, we'll cover that in another video. So, erosion then, if you've got an empty place, it's vulnerable to erosion. You could lose a lot of night nutrients, they could wash through. They could also, if you had a heavy rain or something, and all or a lot of water stormed through the property, you could actually lose physical soil you could it could wash off and then you'd end up with craters and little ripples where all your compost has been trundled along and left in piles deposits elsewhere amendments now these are one that you shouldn't rely on i don't believe i should rely on amendments as far as the liquid mineral biological amendments as far as the liquid versions are concerned because I think they should be as the name suggests an amendment like a a bit of a pick you know if something's looking like these are looking really healthy but if these were looking a bit worse for wear I could give them a bit of a liquid feed just to get them going so that would be organic derived so you know JLF, a Judam liquid fertilizer. Um, if you want to know more, look at my last video that was put like, well, probably two weeks ago now by the time this has come out. It was actually last week filming, but it'd probably be two or three weeks ago by now. Um, on soil health and, you know, amendments. And you'll see JLF came up. Worm juice, that also came up. You could do fermented, um, what do they call it, fermented plant juice. I've done a video on that. Um, you know, all these little things, they're pick-me-ups, you know, for the plants. They get them going again. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't have bare soil and rely on them. I would have other forms of fertility that the microbes could work on. Because if you've just got a liquid coming in that's, you know, 
got all the stuff on it. Yes, it's organic, but it's not doing the soil very good. But, well, it is, but not as good as if you put a good layer of compost or chopped and dropped. You know, it's, it's all about balance. You want to mix and match these ideas. So if you use just compost, it would be bad. It, well, it would be okay, better than no compost, but you could have the best results where the two sort of ideas meet in the middle and that's through using liquid biological and mineral amendments and also solid form compost, manure, worm castings, you name it. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is diversity in planting. Now I've touched upon this, like I said, the clover and the tomatoes, into planting, understorying, um, you know, having lots of different plants and organisms in a, in a small area so that they can work together. So the tomatoes would give shade for the clover because clover likes semi-shade. Tomatoes would give the clover a semi-shade habitat that they like. The clover would be fixing nitrogen out of the air, bring it all in from that air because, you know, what is the 78% nitrogen, something along those lines. The air is, so the clover brings in that nitrogen, locks it into little nodules in the root, which the tomato would then, you know, take out of, and the tomatoes would grow bigger and healthier without the need of any inputs. That could, that could be a self working system you could just let it be you could just leave that grow and it would do all its own thing yes okay clover is a bit of a you know you you'd either have to have an annual clover or some way of terminating it so it'd be like sheep mulching or just pulling it out weeding it but if that's if you wanted to get rid of it you know if you if you put like a row down the middle of each bed that would be enough probably because you know they tap into it or if you wanted to completely sheet mulch your whole polytunnel with it go for it you know it just means that you've got less chance of sowing into it but you know it would work if you were just growing tomatoes or just cucumbers or anything that's getting that height that's out of the sun trap area of the clover but you could also have diversity as in you probably start to notice these videos are getting sort of, there are places where these videos touch and I'm going back to the cabbages, the cabbage white. So if by moving my cabbages around and spreading them out, my kales, my broccoli, sprouts, if I move them out, spread them out, turnips, etc, etc, if I'm spreading them out, the cabbage white has got to fly to different places. I know they they are capable of doing it, but the caterpillars, that's where you want to stop. It's the caterpillars. You can, you know, if you've got one patch that's getting hit hard by the caterpillars, it's one thing. So you can pick all them off and do a JLF out of them if you want, you know, just put them in a bottle of water, shake it every week and you've got a nice little mineral amendment made of caterpillars. Or if you want to you know, put them in the compost, it's up to you. But, they're over there. And my other cabbages are over here maybe. And they're clean, maybe they haven't been noticed much because they've been surrounded by onions or surrounded by a taller crop. So they get away of the main flight path of the butterfly or even the caterpillar. He's not gonna go from 10 meters down there to 10 meters up there. And the bee, you know, oh, that's a wasp. Um, so you know, spreading things out. Also, as far as disease is concerned, potatoes. I've put all my potatoes in one basket this year. All my eggs are in one basket. They're in one block. If I get blight, it's going to hit quite hard, and it's just going to spread through the whole patch, and I'm going to lose most of my potatoes there and then. Whereas if I'd have brought, you know, my sarpamiras up here. My Marfona's there, my Charlotte's down there, my King Edward's here, Desiree's there, and my Maris Piper's there, and my Purple Majesty's here. Then they'd have been spread out a bit more and safer. But because they're all in one block down the bottom, 
who knows if, if blight hits, it could go through them all. Sarpa bearers included, which are meant to be blight resistant or show blight resistance. So, you know, we need that diversity. And also having perennials, back to the perennials now, if we have perennials in that mixture, that increases the diversity. So all my back behind this top garden, the side that the sun doesn't it, because the sun actually comes tracks here because we're north facing. All that back side of the garden is perennial, so they're going to sequester carbon and put carbon into the soil that those plants are going to benefit from, those annuals. But I've also got some pretty big Leilandi trees here. Um, so they're also pulling in quite a bit of carbon, but they are casting shade, so I can use that to my advantage and plant shade-loving crops there. And then the things that like the sun can go down to the new patch. So it's all about thinking about it. So, you know, yes, you could cut those trees down and you'd have sunlight here, but would you have the windbreak? But then there's the other thing of if those trees come down, my tomatoes are all gone in the tunnel. I've lost the tunnel, the tunnel's flat, scrap. So, or this tunnel here, you know, I can see one branch just hanging now. So that could come down and that's my sprout patch gone for the year. So we need to think about diversity. And I think it's an increasing topic that needs to be thought about. So breaking up, with perennials helps a lot because then in the winter we've still got a bit of diversity so you know my veg garden my patch pretty much in winter becomes empty or nearly empty because you know I pick a lot of the root vegetables and store them in the shed um, or I freeze a lot of the fruits or I do them into pickles and stuff and eventually the soil becomes less and less empty day by day until I come to about February March time hit the hungry gap and these soils are pretty empty so that's another thing to thought is just to plant accordingly so all these will be my hungry gap and winter crops that will fill in the gaps keep the soil full for as long as possible. So I'll leave you there now. I've waffled on a bit more than usual, uh, a bit more than I wanted to, but here we are. So uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you again tomorrow.